Well, welcome to another edition of Test Me Time with me, Doug Harris. And Test Me Time is the program where we see what God has done in somebody's life, taking them from where they were to where he wants them to be. And today that testimony is going to be given by Andrew Goodwin. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, fascinating story. Uh, yep. uh, I, I know it already, of course. Um, and I think I want to unpack it for people. But let, let's start quite a young age. You begin to have, well, I suppose what were frightening fantasy experiences. Yeah. Begin to talk us through what happened at that time. Yeah, well, um, the first thing I can remember that was a, a strange, weird experience was um, I was about four years old and um, my mum had asked me to go and get ready for bed. Um, so I came round to the bottom of the stairs um, and, I, and, I, and I looked up to the top of the stairs uh, and I saw a figure at the top of the stairs and there was this um, green figure of a guy about four foot tall had um, yellow eyes and, and looked at me with this really like evil, sadistic look. And, 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 and I stood there just shocked in fear for what seemed like a really long time. It was probably only a few seconds. Mm -hmm. And I went running to my mum, mummy, mummy, there's a monster at the top of the stairs. You know, and um, she's like, no, no, you're all right, there isn't. And she took me upstairs, took me into bed. Um, but I was still aware I was, I mean, I was shook up, I was scared. Um, I mean, people say, oh, when you're here as a child, oh, there's no such thing as monsters and stuff like that. But I'd really seen something, I, it really freaked me out. And, you know, she looked under the bed, looked in the cupboard, no monsters there. And she took me into, took me into bed and, and left me there. And um, we lived in that house for another year and a half after that. And I remember when I would go to bed, I, I would very often, um, feel like a presence. You, did, you didn't see uh, uh, this figure again. I never saw it again. But you sensed something was there. Yeah, it was almost like uh, seeing it stuck with me yeah. and the sense of fear that I had. And, and my, uh, I had a, a younger sister, she was only a year old, and there were things going through my head like, oh, what's, what about my little sister? You know, I wanted to protect her if I could. Mm -hmm. um, and we moved house about a year and a half afterwards. And thankfully, when we moved, the, the sort of, uh, yeah, it did kind of come to an end at that point. Yeah. It really shook me up. And I, I suppose something like that stays with you uh, while, while you're growing up. Yeah. And I, I suppose, do you lack confidence then at times? I mean, how, how did that affect your I think, development? I think, I think definitely, because sometimes when we experience things that are bad and we can't explain them, on some level, they, they have a, a continuing effect on us. And um, I think definitely after that, it affected my childhood, affected me growing up. Um, and it did affect my confidence. I wouldn't necessarily have known it at the time, but yeah, it, it was back, because of that, it. definitely, yeah. Let's move on, because all of these things are gonna come together, but let's move on to okay. 10 years of age. Yeah. Um, and a traumatic experience at that Yeah. Point. Well, um, when, I was, when I was 10, um, I, I was staying with a friend of the family, which I'd often do, they, they were really close. And um, I was staying there and there was, there was an older guy there who, uh, he was about four years older than me and we were quite close. We spent a lot of time playing computer games and stuff like that. Well, anyway, there was an incident that happened where I got sexually abused um, and I found it really difficult. And during the time where it was happening, you know, I was conscious of what was going on in the room with him, but at the same time, I could, I, I could hear audible cackling voices laughing at me. Um, and so there was some sort of audio hallucinations going on and it scared me, it scared me. It was almost like the same thing happening all over again. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that caused, I couldn't look at my friend's um, parents. I couldn't look at them and it, and it and, and I never told anybody about it, you know, for a what, long, long time. What, why was that? What, was that fear? Was that shame? Uh, do, you, do you know why you couldn't share it? Because, I mean, yeah, I mean one yeah. of the things we're told, and, and we tell young people, is if something like that happens, make sure you go and share it. But many seem to say the same thing as you. I couldn't. 
Well, I think it comes down to, um, there, were th there were things, I mean, obviously I was really young, but um, going back to when I saw the monster the first time, there were, there were things that were almost spoken to me on a subconscious level. I remember having strange dreams, strange uh, hallucinations, and I remember that it was almost like uh, the devil had spoken into my life, you can't trust people, you can't trust your family, they can't look after you, they mm -hmm. can't protect you. So, and, and I, I had no reason not to believe that. So the, these things that had happened caused me to be, uh, to, to, to draw back from trust. I didn't trust anybody. And, and in the, the loneliness and the pain of it all, you know, I, I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't trust anybody. I couldn't go to my parents. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, I would have gone to my parents, yes. but there was, that trust just wasn't there. Yes, yes. I was all alone. As far as I was concerned, the, life was a very lonely place. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was no one to turn mm -hmm. to. I mean, that was bad enough, but if anything, things were going to get worse for you. Definitely. Because as, as you get into your mid-teens and late teens, I mean, in, in, in the end, you're diagnosed with schizophrenia. But yeah. I mean, tell us how, how that came about, what experiences you were having, how you felt. I, I know as we look on to people with schizophrenia, I mean, some people think it's a bit of a joke that you've got different, I mean, it obviously is not. It's serious. How did you feel and what did you feel like when you were finally diagnosed? It was very difficult when I got diagnosed and obviously there was a whole series of events that ran up to it. Um, I think by the time that I got diagnosed, I still didn't believe it. I didn't believe that I was ill because I thought I was right. You know, I had a very um, twisted view of reality. Mm. Uh, I was very damaged. But by the time I got diagnosed, I'd obviously been ill for quite a while, but nobody really noticed. Um, I mean, from the age of 13, I started smoking marijuana. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was 15, I was doing it every day. So it was almost like an escape. And, and I never had friends long enough for them to get to know me really well. Um, but when eventually I, I had a, a breakdown, um, and because um, it was my dad, he realized that I'd got a problem. And both my parents have worked most of their lives in mental health. Excuse me. And they, uh, my dad realised I had a problem one time when he came back from work and I was sat in the living room staring at the TV, pointing at it, trying to use like telepathic powers to uh, manipulate things that were going on on TV. Because mm. one, one, one of the funny things about mental illness, and people with schizophrenia can probably relate to it, that, that there's this sort of sense that you're connected in a deeper way with a lot of things that are going on. You know, for me, I, I, I had the TV, um, you know, I, w I wouldn't just sit and watch TV like normal people and find it entertaining. It was almost like there was a direct relationship between my life and what was going on on the TV. But that to you, as you see, as you say, your dad comes in and immediately yeah. sees there's something wrong. But to you, that, that was reality. Absolutely. Yeah. But at the same time, reality didn't make sense. Yes. So I knew that there was loads of this stuff going on around me that was real, but it was like a jigsaw that was all jumbled up. It didn't make sense. So when I get told, when I get a diagnosis that I'm uh, paranoid schizophrenic, to me, that was just another part of the messed up puzzle. And it didn't make sense. It took me a while to be able to actually accept it. Mm -hmm. um, and I lost a, a lot of friends. And, and I think I also lost any hope that I had in my life mm -hmm that actually my life could amount to anything, you know. So, so here is a teenager who should be looking forward to life. I mean, to you, no future? No. When I was 17, they told me that I'd never be employable. I'd never drive. Um, I'd be on medication for the rest of my life. Um, you know, and, and that was it. And, you know, I, I, already, I was already damaged. I was already pretty homeless, uh, hopeless. Mm -hmm. And they, they tell me this, and it's just like, it, everything just everything that I had that, that I actually liked, actually just came crashing down. And it, it sent me into worse depression. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to tell my friends. I didn't want to, and that actually 
caused my drug taking to get worse, you know, and it caused me to so, want to run away even you more. You were on medication, but you were also taking illegal drugs as well. Yeah, so yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. All kinds of different drugs. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and did any of this help? Medication-wise? Yes. Um, I think it did to it did it did to a great degree sometimes. Um, I think it slowed my mind down a bit, right. but it also caused me to put weight on, yeah. um, and it didn't help me to have any hope. It just helped me to uh, not have to struggle as much. But it, it didn't take anything away, and it didn't. I didn't find myself actually able to cope. Mm -hmm. I wasn't coping very well at all. Mm -hmm. Pretty depressing. Um, what, what was it like getting out of bed every day? I, I mean, how do you face a day? I, I, the reason I'm asking is I'm sure there are people watching that can relate to yeah. where you were. Yeah. Praise God you're not there now, Amen. but you, that's where Amen. you were. I mean, what, what, what did it feel like day by day? And how did you motivate yourself to move one foot in front of the other? Life just seemed to be like this horrible cycle I used, to, I used to go through times of not wanting to sleep because I'd have nightmares. Um, you know, I think there were times when I considered suicide, but the, the, the reason why I didn't was because I thought, well, I don't want to let my family down. It was really hard. It was really hard. I don't, I, I, guess, it, I guess being on drugs and I was like, well, you know, I'm going to be able to get stoned and, and that's about it. There wasn't anything that really kept me going, mm -hmm. to be honest. I didn't feel like I had anything to live for. And life was, life was hard. And at the same time, I was an individual who felt nobody understood. And I felt alone and isolated and completely hopeless and just desperate. Mm -hmm. um, and I did have, from time to time, people that would talk to me and, and I'd feel like I, you know, got some sort of sense of, th this is a good friendship and stuff like that. But, I mean, I'd have days where I wouldn't get out of bed. Yeah. I'd have days when I'd just cry for no reason, you know, um, because I just felt so desperate. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, and the weight of that was so heavy. Yeah. Okay, that's, that, that's the picture. You're obviously very different now. Oh, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Now, tell us, what happened? I mean, we know because the program we're on, it's going to be... Christ that changed your life. Amen. But how, how did that come out? How did he start yeah. breaking into your life from this hopeless state, hopeless yeah. mess that you're in, to begin to change you? How did that happen? Well, it's funny because looking back, I could see that God was at work even when I was 13, when I was 17. There were things that happened, but it, it kind of just went straight over my head. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the main thing, the sort of, the, what began to change the, my life was um, when I was um, 20, I was walking through uh, my town, my hometown of Retford, and I was going to look for discarded cigarette ends because I had no money and yeah, it was pretty yeah. depressing. And um, uh, through a mutual friend, a mutual friend introduced me to a guy who was um, in his first year at Bible college. And he, 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 he started asking me questions about myself. I told him, well, you know, this is me. I'm schizophrenic and depressed and all that. And he started telling me about Jesus. Um, and it's a funny thing because I consider my, myself to be someone who'd always believed that there was more to life. There was a, another reality. But I think the search for that truth and knowing had just left me even more crazy because I just kind of came to the conclusion, you can't know the truth. Mm. It's just too, too complicated. But when he started to talk to me about Jesus, you know, I don't remember the words that he said. I know that I didn't understand it, but in my heart, I knew what he was saying was right. And I don't know how. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I knew, but I knew what he was saying was right. You know, he told me that, that it was, um, I had, because of my sin, because of my lifestyle, you know, God's plan for my life was, was much greater um, and that God had a plan for me and that God could rescue me. And it just seemed like too good to be true. I, you know, I believed it, but I couldn't believe it. And he, uh, he turned around and asked me if he, if he could pray for me. And it was a Thursday afternoon in a market town, people hustle and bustle yeah. walking past, took me around the corner, 
started praying, asking God to heal me of schizophrenia. And when he started praying, this, the most amazing thing happened. I felt this, this power come upon me. And, and before I knew it, I'd got my eyes closed and my hands were out like yeah. this. And I was, I was sort of inwardly focusing on, it was like heaven, a drop down, was resting in my hands. And I felt inside me, it was like everything had suddenly changed. Mm. You know, I felt this power, this love, and it was more powerful and more greater than anything I'd ever experienced in my life. You know, forget the highs of drugs. You know, this was real. This mm. was life changing. And it was amazing. I felt this love. I felt this peace. I felt this joy. Um, and, and it was amazing because all I'd ever felt on the inside was loneliness, was darkness, was isolation, was evil. Some of the things that I'd felt on the inside, you know, because bearing in mind I, had, I, I was having voices, yes. I was having hallucinations, you know, I was in turmoil and it was suddenly like the, car, the, the storm, which was a turmoil of a storm, had been stilled. And suddenly I had clarity and he was praying for me and I don't really know what he was praying. But when he finished praying for me, I opened my eyes and he said to me, he said, Andrew, I can just see the Holy Spirit's all over you. Do you want to give your life to Jesus? And I knew, I knew then that that's what I needed to do. I needed to give my life to Jesus. 